Okay, looks like there's a poem, but there's also a letter. Dated December 19th, 2012. That's today. That's today. It's one of our bright seniors pointed that out. Uh, let me read this to you. Just, dear dummy, well this is it. This is the very last time that I will write this holiday poem for you. I simply can't do it anymore. There are only so many ways to create a story about the Gilman Five. I'm 427 years old, and that is elf years, which are more like seven human years each. And I'm tired. You know, dummy, I've been doing this elf writing for a long time. Remember that guy Homer? He couldn't even spell, much less write a poem like the Odyssey. Remember Plato? The Republic, all mine. And then there was Will, Will Shakespeare. He was a nice guy, but he never wrote his own stuff. It was good old Roger, to be or not to be. Hamlet never could make up his mind. At any rate, how I got stuck with you, I haven't a clue. It's been fun, but you really are a dummy. It's been a pretty interesting 15 years doing your stuff, but I've got to pay attention to my new gig. Since I've finished Harry Potter for JK, and The Hunger Games is now in a theater near you, and this stupid poem is done, I'm going to take some time off and go to an island, relax, and get a tan. And then it's on to Xboxes and iPads and video games. I've been called back to the workshop to take over the electronics division. It's a promotion, but I will no longer be able to write, so you are on your own. Hope this does not, let, uh, does not let you down, but you're pretty old in human years. So it's probably best that you step down and stop trying to pretend that you're smart. You're not. You're a dummy. Good luck, and if I were you, I would give up trying, trying to pretend that you can write poetry. Your friend, Roger the Elf. He's a, he's a, uh, he's a nasty little thing sometimes. All right, this is a holiday poem 2012. Twas a day of vacation, a school day of joy. Delight filled the spirit of each Gilman boy. Right after assembly, they'd hear the bell chime to signal the start of a wonderful time. A time filled with family, friends, food, and fun. A time of relaxing, no work to be done. A time of no classes, no homework or tests. A time of late sleeping and afternoon rests. The ninth grade was pumped to be starting vacation. They were in CT20 showing naught but elation. They were all celebrating a little too much. They played tackle football and not two-hand touch. The dean came to stop him, but he couldn't win. He asked those who were playing to turn themselves in. But when they were finished and excuses were heard, Boo said, "'Twas a sin to kill those mockingbirds." In the, second floor, in the second floor commons, you could find the 10th grade. They had finished their papers, all corrections were made. They were all quite exhausted, too tired for chess. Disheveled and sloppy, they had given their best. The juniors, however, were a much different sort. Around the common room tables, they met to cavort. Their laptops were open and screens were aglow as they played Call of Duty, Game of Thrones, or Halo. In the senior room, seniors were biting their nails. They were constantly checking incoming emails. Applications were in and they waited to hear just where in the heck they would be the next year. The faculty was tired, despairing, distraught, but all papers were graded, all classes were taught. They had given their all and remained strong and steady, but there was no denying they were vacation ready. But just as the bell was preparing to ring, there appeared in the common room a terrible thing. It oozed through the windows, squished over the floor, and formed into a shape of 12 feet or more. It was a five-headed monster, all slimy and green, the ugliest creature that they'd ever seen. Pomerantz faded, Rothkin started to cry, Nguyen was trembling, he thought he would die. Edinger left, no one knew where he'd gone. <laughs> Jay Three syllables. Jason, Jason searched for him both hither and yon. Stoller ran for the hills, escape was his plan. Staying to face it was Paul, he'd become a new man. Alexander stood tall and started to speak. Just who are you, creature, and what do you seek? 
You've come onto campus and created a scene. Moreover, you're ugly and a strange shade of green. Be quiet, you worm. I've come for revenge. This Gilman 5 stuff has just got to end. In a moment, that nonsense will not be alive. I'm taking over. I'm the opposite five. One head is dishonor and one is hypocrisy. A third's disrespect and a fourth mediocrity. The fifth I call arrogance. In my heads I take pride. So put on your seat belts. You're going for a ride. With a wave of his hands he just disappeared. Right then the boys changed and began acting weird. Their honor, integrity, and respect simply vanished. Humility and excellence were also both banished. And chaos erupted all over the school. The boys changed completely and began to act cruel. They were arrogant, dishonest, and miserably shoddy. They were a terrible excuse for the school student body. In the science building, the boys were completely unruly. Clark was experimenting on Grinky and Muley. He created a potion of chemical goo, which turned Jake and Davis a bright shade of blue. Uh, working, in the la uh, working the laser were Wilson and Herman. They were trying to vaporize Seibel and Brennan. But Billy and Cormac were faster than light. The laser beam mic nicked them. Uh, the laser beam missed them, but nicked poor Joe White. At one table was Kubis, a scientist gone wild. He was heating a vessel with Betty inside. But Rishi seemed happy as he lolled in that pot. Some like it chilly, but he liked it hot. <laughs> At the gym and arena, they were out of control. Furch, Lynch, and Tilly were all in a roll. They were practicing shooting, but hitting the rim. For balls, they were using Giancola and Kim. Jackson and Grace tried to join in the fun. For a ball, they tried Zunkler. He started to run. They chased him a while, but Sam was too quick. They then spotted Shelberg and settled for Nick. Wonkowitz and Smith practiced moves on the mats, but the mats they were using were Marl and Katz. To make matters worse, Webb got into the fray and was trying to tie in a knot Carter Gray. In the old gym, a volleyball game was beginning. O'Brien was trying, but Johnson was winning. Obrecht was there and he had a racket. He kept trying to serve it, but just couldn't smack it. Serving was Hutchins and spiking was Wade. It was one of the very best games that they played. Goldman and Fisher tried to give it their all, but Kang got too hungry and, and thus ate the ball. On the Oval, a soccer game was just getting started. Walsh and DeSmith were both getting carded. It seems that they tripped and fouled Sims and King. John lost his temper, but Jack just kept on smiling. <laughs> in, the goal, in the goal there was Vint, who was new to the net. He danced and he wiggled as he got himself set. Plunkert from the wing took a right nasty shot. Robbie managed to save it, but not by a lot. Barth came to relieve him, and he'd played before. But Vosvik was kicking, and yes, he did score. But Matt was quite angry that the ball had gone in. The ball they were using was Jesse Nygren. Pogey was there playing football with glee. He ran over Flax and right wing Henry Lee. He, he was going after Cockrell, who was throwing a pass, but Shane faked him out, and he fell on the grass. The, the ball ended up in the arms of Mike Knudsen, Knudsen, whose very swift running helped him to elude men. But Dickerson, Norris, and Kaiser were there. They went in for the tackle, but came up with air. Monahan caught him, but it took him a while. Monahan caught him, but it took him a while. Then Emila hit him, and he hit him with style. Corey Way came along and he had his tea. He split the uprights with Hawkins Rippey. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile in the pool it was not a nice scene. Drosner was standing on Brown and Mac's screen. He kept trying to ski but the engine would stall. He was using his power on Nuj Kondawal. Hud Hud was racing with Kunat Preun, but the race was over way too soon. Muhammad just crushed him by more than a lap. You could say that his race with Saran was a wrap. <laughs> Reutenberg was there, but poor Troika was drowning. <laughs> he, he was finally rescued by Parshad and Downing. <laughs> when he came up for air and got onto his feet, the music was playing. He had not missed a beat. East and Lounsbury were playing at squash. Cortesi and Gardner were eager to watch. <laughs> Granger was playing along with Mike Schaefer. Russell stayed off the court. He thought it was safer. 
What went on in the wood shop was really not good. On the lathe, Hanley locked in both Ahmad and Woods. No one was sure what he planned to create, but both Rafe and Michael began to rotate. There on the drill press was Jeremy Choi, who was trying to make a new kind of toy. He inserted the drill and adjusted the tang and was ready to aerate both Davis and Lang. In the art studio, matters were not too sublime. Shea stretched on his canvas both Cha and Delheim. He was trying to paint a true masterpiece, but his brush had no bristles since he used Daniel Reese. The music room rocked, James Choi played violin, the bow he was using was John Chirichian. Strumming his guitar was Calvin Gray. McBride tried to sing, there was really no way. <laughs> On the stage, Sutter practiced his best fencing moves. His saber was flying, he just couldn't lose. Annoyed, Duncan told him to just knock it off. It was then Conrad skewered Gramatikov. The spotlight went on, someone just threw the switch. It was Teddy or Noah, you couldn't tell which. <laughs> Rouse, Rouse started acting, he was actually not bad. Adam started to cry because the scene was so sad. Priebus started to tap dance, as did Ihanatu. They were tapping and dancing on Sandberg and you. Gillette and Fertitta tried to find their own grooves, but neither possessed any admirable moves. The school was a mess. It was in such great need, <clears throat> but at last Zane McFarlane told us how to succeed. He, sa he said that in order to fix this disaster, we needed to see the incoming headmaster. The boys all then ran to see Mr. Smythe. In his deep southern drawl, he gave them this advice. It's easy for y'all to defeat this green entity. <laughs> but first, you must try to regain your integrity. If you work on your honor, humility, and if you work on your honor, respect, and humility, you'll regain your excellence and restore our community. With that, the boys struggled to follow the five, and they found that within them, those traits were alive. They knew if they practiced the five, they could win. So they screwed up their courage and went to begin. Each act of goodness would cut off a head until finally the monster's great power was dead. Tendler showed honor and Emmett integrity. That hewed off the heads of dishonor and hypocrisy. Mediocrity was severed when Evans showed excellence and Robinson's humility decapitated arrogance. And by McLean demonstrating this trait of respect, the monster was headless, as one would expect. So the monster's heads all lay on the floor, and the opposite five blindly groped for the door. You worms have defeated me, I cannot survive. If you practice the five, I can't stay alive. McAvoy laughed and Levine looked relieved. Radoff and Cooked, at last, both believed. And with that, Smythe walked in and said in his way, y'all get out opposite five, you're finished today. The green thing picked up his heads in disgrace and amidst cheers from the boys, he vacated the place. And the spell was then lifted and order restored, honor and the rest of the five weren't ignored. In fact, they were practiced by all of the boys and this led to happiness and all kinds of joys. For the five is a compass, a character guide that strengthens your core which is deep down inside. If you practice the five, you live life as you should. You're a man of great character, of force for the good. And with that, the bell rang and the boys were set free. Vacation was starting, and starting with glee. They were leaving much wiser, with character intact. They knew how to live and they knew how to act. So you young men of Gilman, heed the lesson they learn. It's by living the five that your character's earned. And remember this lesson from your first day to last, always live by the five and live them with class. Happy holidays, fellas. Have a great time.